Hello class, this is section 2.5 and in this video we are going to talk about steady state temperatures for a disk. Since we are working on a disk instead of a square or rectangle, it makes sense to switch to polar coordinates. And you may have remembered from multivariable calculus that there is a way to write down the Laplacian, the Laplace operator, in terms of r and theta rather than x and y. And we have it written down as so. So this is going to be our Laplace equation. It is also set to zero. So we are considering a disk of radius A. And we have a temperature on the boundary. The circumference of the disk has a temperature F theta. And we want to figure out what the steady state temperature is. We also secretly have two more boundary conditions. Note that since we are working on a circle, it must be true that if we consider the angle minus pi, that's the same thing as the angle pi. This also applies for the derivative, the partial derivative with respect to theta of r minus pi is the same thing as the partial derivative with respect to theta of r pi. Obviously, since, the pos since this point over here can be expressed in two different ways as the angle pi or the angle minus pi. It should not be surprising to learn that the same technique works. We start by finding the product solution. We write down ur theta equals f theta gr. When you plug it into the Laplace equation, this looks a little bit nastier than the case for xy coordinates, but it's not too different. We have 1 over r, f theta, partial, partial r, r times partial g, r over partial r, plus 1 over r squared. We take the gr term out now, and we take the second derivative of f theta with respect to theta squared. This is equal to minus 1 over r squared gr partial squared f theta partial of theta squared. And now moving all the r terms to the left and the theta terms to the right, we get that r over gr partial partial r r partial gr partial r is equal to minus second derivative of f theta respect to theta times 1 over f theta. So once again, we are in this situation where the left side is a function of r and the right side is a function of theta. Therefore, they must both be constant, and that's called a constant lambda, as usual. So again, we have to consider whether we want the sign in front of lambda to be positive or negative. So let's think about which the f or the g is the function for our eigenvalue problem. This should be f. The g expression is very complicated, and the f equation on the right-hand side has the structure for an eigenvalue problem. So remember that our goal is to get f double prime plus lambda f equals zero. That's the standard structure of the eigenvalue problem. But to get that, lambda should be, should be positive lambda, not negative lambda. Let's figure out then our eigenvalue problem. And we have, as we stated, that partial squared, partial theta squared, f theta plus lambda f theta is equal to zero. That's our equation. But what are our boundary values? These are simply the hidden boundary values that we alluded to that related to the fact that our boundary condition was a circle. So since we have u r minus pi equals u r pi, this implies that g r f minus pi equals g r f pi. But again, if uh, g r is zero, then our solution is just a trivial solution, so we're not going to consider that. So we can divide both sides by gr. 
to get f minus pi equal to f pi. And similarly, from the boundary condition partial u, r minus pi equals partial u, partial theta, r pi, we get the boundary condition f minus pi, um, derivative respect to theta, is equal to the derivative f pi. So we have our, our eigenvalue problem with two equations. And doing what we did in ODEs, we can determine that the eigenvalues are lambda equals 0, 1, 2, sorry. I mean they are 0, 1 squared, 2 squared, 3 squared, and so on. And the eigenfunctions, uh, let's call this n squared, and the eigenfunctions are going to be either sine and theta or cosine and theta. So let's also look at the separable equations problem. This is what it looks like, lambda equals r over g, derivative of r, derivative of g. We can set this lambda as n squared, since all our eigenvalues are of the form n squared for n integer. And if we simplify, we get this equation over here. Now, while this may look superficially like some of the equations you've learned in ODEs, this is actually really complicated. Most of the examples you've seen in ODEs have constant coefficients, but here our coefficients have r's in them. So this actually is a type of differential equation that isn't typically taught in ODE, so I think it's unlikely that students in, students in this class would know it. I'm just going to give you the answer, and it's going to be for n equals 0, just g equals c1 rn plus c2 1 over rn. Sorry, I mean for n not equal to 0, it's going to be rn, and the two linearly independent solutions are going to be rn 1 over rn. And for the case where for n equals 0, we have instead gr equals c1 plus c2 times log r. Note, however, that for r equals 0, in the center of our circle over here, log r becomes minus infinity. And this doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make sense to have an infinite temperature anywhere inside the disk. So we can just rule out this case. So here, obviously, C2 tilde has to be 0. And it turns out that for n equals 0, our only solution is C1 for some constant. So given we have these solutions for G and these solutions for the F, we can now list down all the product solutions. And it turns out that our solution, u r theta, is going to be of the form a naught plus sum from n equals 1 to infinity of a n r n cosine n theta plus the sum from n equals 1 to infinity again of b n rn sine n theta. And as usual, we have to use the boundary condition of theta equals u a theta to figure out what the a0 and a1 to an, b1 to bn should be. And using standard Fourier theory tricks, we can calculate these solutions for a0, for an, and for bn. And the rest of the second two formula, of course, apply when n is bigger or equal to 1.